Libya is a country in North Africa that for most of the past decade has been mired in civil war and violence that has claimed the lives of tens of thousands. Even two years now after the most recent civil war ended with a ceasefire agreement, the US, UK, EU, Canadian, and Australian governments all maintain a maximum level 4 travel advisory warning, urging against all travel for their citizens to the country due to the ongoing state of violence and danger. But I'm not going to talk about any of that in this video. Instead, I want to show you one of the most incredible things about Libya, and how they managed to pull off one of the most impressive macroengineering projects in human history that pretty much nobody in the West has ever heard of or cared about. I probably don't need to tell you that Libya is a pretty dry place, but you've really got to understand the sheer dearth of this country's water supply. More than 90% of Libya's territory is a dry and inhospitable desert where there are genuinely locations where it will not rain for decades at a time. At this location next to Egypt, for example, the last time it was ever recorded to have rained was back in 1998, more than 24 years ago. Everywhere beneath this line, it will only rain less than 4 inches per year on average, and even worse, Libya is literally the only country in Africa, and one of the very few in the world, that doesn't have a single natural river of any kind they can access for fresh water. From a water access perspective, these facts make Libya one of the emptiest and driest locations on the planet, and therefore one of the worst imaginable places to run and maintain a civilization in. In terms of renewable water supplies, Libya has even less available water to drink than Cyprus, a dry island in the Mediterranean that is nearly 200 times smaller in size than Libya. This has almost always meant that since time immemorial, the only places in Libya where people could actually build cities and civilization was within the very narrow strip of land above this line, where it actually rains just enough to supply an amount of water. Even a day, the only two areas in the country where there's enough water to support agriculture and farming are up in the northwest around the capital and largest city Tripoli, and in the northeast around the second largest city Benghazi. Correspondingly, more than 90% of Libya's contemporary population lives within just 10% of Libya's territory north of the line where it rains, and they're almost entirely concentrated within just these four largest cities. Most of Libya is simply an uninhabitable wasteland from a civilizational perspective. And with only these limited habitable areas up in the north, it's much more helpful to think of Libya's true shape and size as being more like this. About the same size as Moldova in Europe. And that will make it unsurprising for you to learn that Libya's entire population is only around 7 million people, despite being of a comparable size overall to Mexico. The vast majority of Libya's land is simply worthless for civilization. Or so they thought for a really long time. By the 1950s, Libya only had a tad more than a million inhabitants, and was probably not that much more populous than it had been during the Roman era thousands of years beforehand. The country had only just gained independence from Italy and was desperately impoverished, almost completely dependent upon foreign aid and the meager rent that they were receiving from American and British air bases located on their territory. But then, in 1956, everything would suddenly change forever with the very first discovery of oil in the country right here. From there, it quickly became apparent that this vast and ancient wasteland that had been disregarded by human civilizations for eons had secretly been hiding something all along of tremendous civilizational value, some of the largest reserves of oil to be found anywhere on the planet. It turned out that Libya's oil reserves are the largest anywhere on the African continent, and the tenth largest of any country in the world, and, to boot, are strategically located near to Europe, one of the world's largest oil consumers. The ensuing oil boom that followed brought revenues, jobs, and wealth to Libya on a scale that had never before been seen. And the country's population finally began to skyrocket. Within 20 years of the first discovery of oil in 1956, Libya's population would roughly double by 1976, and then would more than double again over the next 20 years by 1996. But with this huge and unprecedented surge in opportunity and population, Libya began hitting its ancient problem again. There just isn't a lot of water to support a lot of people, even within the small strip of land along the Mediterranean coast where it actually rains. Knowing that they would need to find more water to keep up with the growth in population, the Libyans began almost desperately searching for alternative sources. They mostly came up with three different solutions, all of which kind of sucked in pretty different ways. The first, of course, was that since Libya enjoys a long coastline straddling the Mediterranean, 
They could, hypothetically, construct a system of desalination plants that would transform the undrinkable salt water of the Mediterranean into usable fresh water. This is a technique that has been used with great success in nearby Israel ever since the 1960s, a country that has faced similar water problems as Libya. But the big problem with desalination is that it is extremely expensive, and for Libya, a country that by 2010 had an economy that was still more than three times smaller than Israel's, that was simply never going to be as good of an option. Libya's second choice involved shipping in fresh water on tankers across the Mediterranean from Europe, and their third choice involved doing the same thing, but with a pipeline. And both of those choices sucked because not only would they still be expensive, but they would also force Libya into being in a situation where they were dependent on Europe for their water supply. Which wasn't exactly an ideal situation for a country that had just emerged as being independent after decades of colonial rule from Europe. Libya's answer and solution to this water problem would ultimately come in just as unexpected and lucky of a fashion as their huge discovery of oil. As the Libyans continued with their hunt for more oil reserves across the desert in the south, they accidentally stumbled into a discovery deep underground that was perhaps even more valuable to them than the oil. Fresh water, and a lot of it. You see, relatively unknown back then was that across the most recent ice age that lasted between 120,000 years ago and about 11,500 years ago, northern Africa was a very, very different place and it had accumulated an insane amount of water. We now understand that as the Earth slowly changes its orbit around the Sun, it causes dramatic changes in the environment in northern Africa and, as a result, there are cycles of alternating desert and grasslands here that last for thousands of years. And as the last ice age began to end around 12,000 years ago, Northern Africa was right in the midst of the opposite cycle that human civilization has always experienced it as. Rather than the desert we know today, Northern Africa was covered by grass, forests, and lakes, and it rained there a ton. But as the Earth continued to change its orbit, the long cycle of death and rebirth here that has been going on for millions of years continued, and Northern Africa steadily began turning back into the desert around 5,500 years ago, forcing the people there who once knew nothing but abundant water to search for now scarce supplies like rivers, like the Nile, which quickly became the genesis point for ancient Egyptian civilization around the same time period 5,100 years ago. The cycle is, of course, expected to continue and transform the Sahara back into a lush, green grassland, with abundant rainfall again around 10,000 years from now into the future. But across those tens of thousands of years of rainfall in northern Africa before the cycle had ended, the rain collected down into aquifers just beneath the surface. And in the 1950s, these were the aquifers discovered by the Libyan oil hunters on accident. It's currently estimated that if you were to add up all of the water in the aquifers beneath just Libya alone, it would add up to around 35,000 cubic kilometers worth, which is a lot. That is more water than exists in all of the North American Great Lakes combined, in addition to Lake Malawi and Lake Victoria in Africa, Africa's second and third largest lakes respectively by volume. The Libyans had just hit the water jackpot almost immediately after already hitting the oil jackpot. But there were a couple pretty major problems with this newfound water supply. First, since this supply of water had fallen as rain tens to hundreds of thousands of years ago, back when northern Africa was more humid and temperate, and now, under the current cycle, this region will receive almost zero rainfall for thousands of more years to come, there isn't actually any possible way to replenish any of the water once it is taken out from the aquifers. And it's therefore not a renewable source, and it's more accurately classified as fossil water. The aquifer's water supply, while vast in theory, is also finite and irreplaceable. And when it runs out, the Libyans will just be back in a lot of trouble again. The second problem was that all of these aquifers existed underground across multiple locations, deep in the center and south of the country, hundreds of miles away from any of Libya's actual population centers up in the north, along the coast, with pretty much zero infrastructure or transportation options, and nothing but empty desert in between them. At first, the Libyans thought they could solve this problem by simply using the water where it already existed, in order to create large-scale agricultural projects in the middle of the desert. But this initial plan would quickly change following a military coup and the rise to power of an ambitious young colonel named Muammar Gaddafi in 1969. Gaddafi was destined to become one of the most eccentric, divisive, and longest-lasting leaders of the 20th century. And under his leadership, the Libyans devised an almost crazy-sounding plan to permanently alter one of their greatest of geographic handicaps that had nerfed Libyan civilization for eons. Their complete lack of any rivers. 
The plan was to simply overcome nature and geography by building their own man-made rivers through pipelines across the barren Sahara between the vast and newly discovered aquifers in the south and the rapidly growing cities in the north along the Mediterranean. The plan would take decades under Gaddafi's leadership to build, and it would ultimately become the largest and the most ambitious irrigation project ever carried out in human history. And it would change the destiny of Libya as a nation forever. The Libyans ended up calling this plan the Great Man-Made River Project, a vast system of pipelines buried underground to avoid evaporation and pumps that would be constructed beneath the sands of the desert that would bring the water up to Libya's growing and thirsty cities in the north. More than 4,000 kilometers worth of pipes were planned to be constructed for this purpose, which if laid end-to-end -end would nearly cover the entire distance between Los Angeles and New York City. In addition to this absurd length of pipe, the system would eventually grow to contain more than 1,300 different water wells, most of which are more than half a kilometer deep into the ground, penetrating the desert landscape and sucking up the water from the depths below. On a yearly basis, this system now provides around 2.4 cubic kilometers worth of fresh water up to the now more than 7 million and growing citizens of Libya in the cities of the north. Which isn't really a huge amount of water, but it's enough to grant Libya an equivalent amount of usable water now as Luxembourg has in Europe. And it's more water than Saudi Arabia has got, despite the Saudis having five times Libya's population. Today, the Great Man-Made River provides 70% of all the fresh water used by the Libyan people, and without it, the Libyans would have been forced into becoming more reliant on importing water somewhere from abroad. But building out this whole system of underground water pipelines has taken the Libyans decades to accomplish, and it still isn't even finished either. Construction on the system only first began back in 1984 on Phase 1, and to date, the Libyans have spent approximately $25 billion building out what they have. The original plan back then was, and technically still is today, to construct the Great Man-Made River in five distinct phases, each of them planned for by the Great Man-Made River Authority set up to meet specific water volume requirements within certain geographic areas. You see, within southern Libya there's five discovered major underground water basins. Beginning with the first three, the Hamada, Sirte, and Kufra basins, they're all located in the southeast of the country and are connected to the greater Nubian sandstone aquifer that also extends across Egypt, Chad, and Sudan. This is the largest known fossil water aquifer system ever discovered in the world, containing what could possibly be around 150,000 cubic kilometers worth of irreplaceable water across all four of these nations, which would be equivalent to around 5% of all the fresh water locked away up in the glaciers of Greenland. Other than their share of this huge aquifer, the Libyans also controlled the new Sahara Basin in the northwest and the Merzak Basin in the southwest. Phase one of the project was focused on constructing the water pipeline from as Safir and Tazirbo in the south up to the large cities of Benghazi and Sirtia in the north, tapping into the enormous Nubian sandstone aquifer and bringing the system online. This was the largest phase of the project, and it alone used up an insane amount of material. Two and a half million tons of cement, 13 million tons of aggregate, two million kilometers worth of wire, and over a quarter of a million sections of concrete pipe for the water to pass through that would be buried underground, each of them measuring a staggering eight meters in diameter. It took the Libyans 12 years to finish constructing phase one by 1996, and it ended up providing two million cubic meters worth of water a day to these thirsty cities up in the north. Phase 2 then began shortly afterwards further over to the west. Pipelines were built beginning in the Merzak Basin, and they now deliver more than a million cubic meters of water a day up to Libya's largest city and capital, Tripoli, and the surrounding area. It took them four years to finish up this phase by 2000, and then came the final phase to actually be completed so far, Phase 3 which was mostly focused on adding another pipeline from the Nubian sandstone aquifer into the existing Phase 1 network, providing more water to Benghazi and Sirte in the process. This phase was only completed in 2009, and by that point, there were still gaps in the system that hadn't been constructed yet. Phase 4 planned for new lines to be constructed from these aquifers to the north and finally connecting the city of Tobruk to an aquifer, while Phase 5 would finally construct a line up here in the north that would finally connect the western and eastern systems together and largely unify the great man-made river into a single finished system across the country, where all the major cities in the north could access water from anywhere else in the system. But these final phases were doomed to never be completed, because just two years after the completion of Phase 3 in 2011 came the political tumult of the Arab Spring, 
leading to a revolution within Libya against Gaddafi's now 42-year-long regime. With Gaddafi being long considered an enemy of the West for a very long list of reasons, NATO decided to intervene against his forces with a no-fly zone and a methodical bombing campaign in support of the rebels that quickly turned the tide of the revolution in the country against him, eventually culminating with his violent overthrow and death. The power vacuum left within the country after the end of his more than four decades of rule threw Libya into civil war and chaos that has lasted for much of the decade plus of history ever since. And in a sense, the great man-made river project kind of died alongside Gaddafi. In the chaos that has reigned ever since his death, nobody has so far managed to put together the resources or the will to finish what he started and construct phase four or phase five. And the great man-made river, what Gaddafi called the eighth wonder of the world, remains incomplete. And only time will tell if that'll remain the case forever. As the revolution in Libya raged against Gaddafi's regime more than a decade ago, it begged several fundamental questions about 21st century society. It was obvious that the root cause for the unrest across the Arab world at that time was mostly due to the region's poverty. Despite all of their oil wealth, the average Libyan earns only 14% of the same income as the average American, and can expect to live for six years less. And a third of the Libyan population lives in dire poverty. And while these differences are obviously significant, they're actually pretty small when compared with the differences between the United States and the world's poorest countries, like Zimbabwe, Afghanistan, North Korea, or Sierra Leone where more than half of the population lives in poverty. So why is Libya poorer than the United States? What constraints exist within Libya that prevent them from becoming more prosperous? Is the poverty of Libya guaranteed reality forever, or can it be eliminated? These are just some of the big and important questions that are brilliantly and expertly answered in Why Nations Fail. The Origins of Power, Prosperity, and Poverty that was published back in 2013 during the midst of the Arab Spring revolutions. I just got done listening to this whole story on Audible, and I found it to be incredibly captivating and engaging. Since you just finished watching my whole video about Libya and their struggles, I'd highly encourage you to give this audiobook a listen as well in order to gain more critical global context. Especially considering that my deal with Audible will allow you to listen to it all for free. You see, Audible is the destination for audio entertainment. They've got audiobooks, podcasts, guided wellness programs, comedy routines, and more. Personally, I love reading, but I rarely have the free time to actually just sit down and enjoy a print book. Audible, meanwhile, can be injected into any moment your ears are free. It genuinely transforms doing the dishes, commuting to work, going grocery shopping, and so many other chores into actually enjoyable and meaningful experiences. A subscription gets you access to a huge catalog, but for anything that's not on there, you get one credit a month to download any other audiobook you want for free. But by using my link that's available by clicking the button that's here on your screen right now, texting Real Life Lore to 500 500, or heading to audible.com slash real life lore, you'll get a 30 day free trial meaning that you'll get a free credit to download any audiobook you want that you'll get to keep forever, including Why Nations Fail or anything else you see that ends up piquing your interest. You'll also be supporting Real Life Lore while you're at it, so head over to audible.com slash reallifelore to sign up today, and thanks for watching.